Good morning. Welcome to church online. We're glad you're with us. Say hi to somebody in the comments. We'll get seen here together. Well, I was lost with a broken heart. You picked me up, now I'm set apart. From the ash I am born again. Forever safe in the Savior's hand. But you are more than my words could say. I'll follow you, Lord, for all my days. I'll fix my eyes, follow in your ways. Forever free in unending grace. Because you are, you are, you are my freedom. We lift you higher, lift you higher. Your love, your love, your love never ending. Oh, oh, oh. You are alive in us. Nothing can take your place. You are your love has set us free you are alive in us nothing can take your place you are all we need your love has set us free Whoa. Whoa. of the darkest night you let your love be the shining light you're breaking chains that were holding me you sent your son down to set me free till everything of this world will fade i'm pressing on till i see your face well i will live that your will be done well i won't stop till your kingdom come because you are, you are, you are my freedom. We lift you higher, lift you higher. Your love, your love, your love never ending. Oh, oh, oh. You are alive in us. Nothing can take your place. You are all we need. Your love has set us free. Cause you are, you are, you are my freedom. We lift you higher. Yeah, you are, you are, you are my freedom. We lift you higher, lift you higher. You love, you love, you love never ending. Oh, oh, oh. You are alive in us. Nothing can take your place. Hey, Crosswater, good morning. This is Pastor John. Got a couple of announcements for you. Got a great opportunities to actually see each other in person. It's been a little bit hard with just this online stuff, not being able to see each other and interact with one another. But we do have some opportunities for that. 
Actually, the last few Tuesdays, we've been getting together in the parking lot for some worship and prayer and encouragement, a little bit of teaching. And we've got one more of those coming up this Tuesday, September 1st, which is kind of crazy that it's already September 1st. But our last one in the parking lot on Tuesday, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. We'd love to have you. Uh, we are you know, social distancing and all those things. So please bring a chair. Come join us. Great opportunity to just get outside, see one another, worship Jesus, and have a good time together. So we'd love to see you for that. And then also, happy to announce that we are going to be getting together again in person for Sunday services starting on the 13th. So a couple weeks from now, uh, we're going to be doing that uh, like we were before. We're going to have to RSVP and and do those things just to make sure that we've got everything set up the way that we need it to be set up and, and ready for you to show up. Uh, we will have some overflow opportunities in the cafe, so we're going to ask uh, you to RSVP, and that'll guarantee you a seat, um, but we may have some extra room, and if not, then we'll, we'll have some room in the cafe set up. Um, we still do need to do the social distancing and the masks, so please be aware of that, um, and we'll have that RSVP up and ready to go for you here in about a week. Uh, But we'd love to see you for that. And then speaking of the 13th, we actually have a special treat after service on the 13th. We've got a cookie dough food truck coming out at noon on the 13th, so after second service. And it's going to be right outside here, and we're going to have that available. It's going to be some some sweet treats. You get some cookie dough. You can put it in a cone. You can put an ice cream scoop on top if you want to do that. Uh, So come join us for service and then stick around for that or maybe just come out for that later if that works for you. But they'll be here at noon until they sell out, essentially. So for at least a couple hours, come out and join us for that. And then last thing I want to let you know about on the the 13th is we are continuing to raise money for RIP medical debt. Uh, we are, we're getting closer. We're at almost $9,000 right now, and we are trying to get to $15,000 by the 13th. Um, and that will actually help us eliminate $1.5 million in medical debt for families in Snohomish County, Skagit County, and then part of King County as well. So we'd love to have you help us out with that, contribute to that. You can do that on our website uh, crosswaterchurch.org slash RIP medical. You can also, if you come to service on the 13th, you can bring cash or check uh, that day as well for that. Uh, so we'd love to have you do that. It's a great way to, to bless families in our local area by helping relieve medical debt that they've incurred. So please be part of that. But great to have you guys joining us this morning. We'll get back into some worship and we'll see you soon. Talk to you later. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. Lord, I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Touching every heart, I worship you. Oh, I worship you. And you are here, healing every heart. I worship you. 
worship you. Lord, I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. Oh, I worship you. And you are here, mending every heart, Lord. I worship you. I worship you, Lord, because you are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. 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 Yeah, that is who you are. Yeah, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. It's been a crazy few months. And for me, you know, there have been times where God has felt really absent to me. Like, I wasn't sure where he was. And there's been a lot of division. We're in a series on reconciliation right now. And maybe you felt a lot of division in your life, and you felt like you've been divided from people you consider really close friends, or you're just not seeing eye to eye with people. God's doing something. Maybe he's doing something in your own heart. Maybe he's doing something in the heart of somebody else. But he's working. He's working always behind the scenes. And we don't see a lot of it. And a lot of times it can leave us feeling like he's not there with us. But, but he is. He's here. He's working. So we're going to continue to sing here. Even when you don't see it, even when you don't feel it, God's working. Let's remind ourselves of that this morning. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. But even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Well, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Well, even when I don't see it, you're working. Well, even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Miracle worker, promise keep the light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are, you are way maker. Miracle worker, promise keep your light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yeah, that is who you are. And that is who you are. And that is who you are. That is who you are. 
Yeah, that is who you are. 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 Yeah, that is who you are. 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 Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. down on your hands and knees look on your handiwork and build a house so you may dwell in me so you may dwell in me the work was done with nothing but wood and nails in your scarf worn hand oh show me how to work and praise trusting that I am your instrument oh loving laborer with the sweat upon your face Lord build a table that I too may join you in the Father's place Oh in the Father's place The work was done with nothing but wood and nails in your scarborn hands. Oh, show me how to work and praise, trusting that I am your instrument. Knowing that 
the task is finished the dead will rise and give you praise a wood and nails will not hold them down these wooden tombs will break them soon and fashion them into flower beds the curse is done the battle won swords been down into plowshares your scarborn hands will join with them serving at the table you prepared I'm a humble carpenter Hey, you guys, here we are together this morning. We're worshiping Jesus together. And in so doing, every single time we get together at Crosswater, we remember Jesus died. Jesus paid his life for our sin debt. And we call this communion. It's the Lord's table. Hopefully you have the elements. We have these little things, right, with the little wafer that tastes a little bit like styrofoam. But it's not so much the taste. It's the reminder And this whole week and just so much going on and even hurricanes and just shootings and people being mistreated and people defending their own bad behaviors, we need a Savior. And that's why we remember Jesus with communion. I want to go to Romans 12. Pastor John and I were talking this week about how there's a difference between Bible study and Bible doing. And Romans 12 has this great example, and it was in the app on Thursday. Hopefully you checked that out. And you're reading along with us. But we want to remember Jesus. Remember his example. Remember his sacrifice. And so when we do that, when we slow down during worship, we want to get together. We want to remember him. So please remember him and remember his example. His body broken and his blood shed. Represented by this drink and by this food. But totally a reminder for us on how to live And how to lay down our lives. So let's check it out. Romans 12, 14 through 21. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. That means don't consider yourself better. But associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Now that's when we jump in and go, yeah, okay, let's burning coals. No, this is my being kind. And finally, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Remember a long time ago, I showed you this, right? Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is such just a simple thing. Thumbs up. People just joke around with that. Jesus didn't joke around. He laid down his life to overcome evil with good. Would you do that? Remembering Jesus today. His body broken. His blood shed. That we would see him overcome our evil with his good. Jesus, thank you for your body. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for loving us and giving us life. 
we do this today in remembrance of you. I want to be somebody, Jesus, that follows you and is like you. And I pray that for my friends and my family all over the world. God, I pray for those who are suffering, those who are in the wake of storms that are real, storms that are mental, and storms, Lord, that look like injustice and prejudice and pain and agony. God, may we not try to repay evil with evil but we would do good to people like you have done, starting with those closest to us and moving out from there. God, I love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I'll see you in a few minutes. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, Lost without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now, life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now. Life begins with you. Release from my chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. But he canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace was so free, washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hell. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Lord, your grace is so free, washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. We're free, free, forever we're free. So come join the song of all the redeemed. Yeah, we're free, free, forever, amen. When death 
death was arrested and my life began. Yeah, we're free, free, forever we're free. We come join the song of all the redeemed. Yeah, we're free, free, forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested and my life began. Let's pray together. Lord, um, really we, we recognize that life begins and ends when you say it does. God, that you were the breath of life that, that breathed into the dust and life came. And God, we recognize too that when you went to that cross and you died and you walked out of that grave, life walked out of that grave with it. You brought life into our lives, God, by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. So God, today we just look to you for that life. And we admit and just confess honestly that all the things that we've been looking to try and find life in, those things are empty and they're void and they're not going to do it for us. But your very word that spoke life into existence, that is where we find true, full life. So God, we run to you today to find that. God, open up our ears and our eyes that we can hear about it, that we can know it, that we can know your love, we can know just how good you are. God, remind us of those relationships in our lives that are broken, that need healing. God, remind us of the relationship that we have with you that's broken, that needs healing. God, humble us today. Turn us around to repentance. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Hey, you guys, I'm back. And uh, I got to be honest with you. This week has been um, one of those weeks where so many different things coming at you, and you're wondering what's next, right? And it just seems like every week is like that. And somebody joked about 2020 being like Jumanji, like the next thing is worse than the next thing. And I don't know that it's like that. I've seen some really cool things, people having babies, my daughter getting married, just some really, really cool things. And, and a friend of mine coming closer and closer to Jesus through one of the most difficult things ever in his whole entire life. But man, this week, it's just been, it's been rough. And even thinking about the people that are not watching this broadcast that we do, it's just like, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? How are we doing things? And how are we reaching people missionally with the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, I want to thank you for joining us. If you're still here, if you're beyond the two minutes that the average person who's watching this is watching if you've gone beyond that thank you jesus loves you he loves you whether you're two minutes or 20 minutes or two hours but we're going to get together today again to look at and to recognize being reconciled and i want to pray and i want to ask for god to open up our minds and our hearts but i want to ask you to really let the holy spirit cut into areas in your life that you need him to whether you want them to or not. I've got some friends right now that are struggling with things that I hope to never have to go through. But they're actually seeing Jesus in it all over the world. Stuff in Lebanon still going on, right? Stuff in Asia still going on. Stuff in Africa still going on. There's people being killed just because they're Christians. People being killed just because they're from a different tribe. And we're actually seeing that in our own country. We need reconciliation. We need to have people in harmony. And that really only happens in Jesus. And so, again, if you are somebody who gives of your life, including of your finances, right here and through here, you're blessing people all around the world. And I'm grateful for that. I hope that you would know that that is not taken lightly. And it is also between you and God. And so let's just pray and offer up this day. Jesus, you are righteous and holy in every single way. And that is way different than us. We're being made righteous and holy. and We have become your righteousness because of you becoming our sin. 
But Lord, we need you. I need your help. I ask God this morning that you would help not only focus me and all of us in, but that we would know your word more. We would know you more. We would know others more, and we would know ourselves more, and we would live it out. It's like we were talking about in communion, that we wouldn't just be studying the Bible. We would be living out the Bible and doing what we've read. And I pray that again, especially as we get into Philemon yet again today. Holy Spirit, thanks for writing this for us. Pray for eyes to see it and ears to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you know we called it Reconciled, and there's a lot of stuff we looked at last week. I encourage you to go back and watch that or listen to that again if, or, or for the first time if you weren't here. But reconciliation is a big deal to God, and there's so much about it. You just even look in Romans 12 like we talked about in communion. He wants us to overcome evil with good. And we get to overcome hardships and being offended by being people who lay down our lives, lay down our rights by standing up for what's right at the same time. And I know that just seems so contradictory, counterintuitive. Laying down your life to be able to pick it up, well, that was modeled by Jesus, for goodness sake. And so what we looked at is that there's three roles that we're always going to play in this world when it comes to reconciliation, being restored, being settled, settling accounts, right? Bringing people together, allowing people to do something that was an unwelcome thing, and that would be forgiveness or laying down their lives or helping one another understand one another. And those three roles are this. Mediator, which we looked at last week, the Apostle Paul, right? Writing from prison, where he's imprisoned, for telling the good news of Jesus Christ, where previously he used to try to put people in prison, right? Put people in prison that were Christians, and now he's in prison for being a Christian. And so he wrote this letter to his friend Philemon, and we're going to unpack it again, but Philemon was the one that was offended. And then there was an offender in this story, and his name was Onesimus. And so we're going to look today in Philemon, and so crack that open. It's a small little letter with a huge message, right? A long message. We're talking about it 2,000 years later. And it was a personal message that was going to have a public audience. And Philemon's response was going to be publicly witnessed. And so we're going to look at Philemon and how he was addressed and how he had the opportunity to go from being offended to being somebody that would be reconciled to his offender. And so let's do that. We're going to get into Philemon. It's 1 through 25. I'm going to read all of it. I hope this isn't when you click out. Hang in there with us. It's God's word. It's counterintuitive. It's countercultural. And in some ways, it's even unfair that we would be asked to lay down our lives. But Jesus is the king of knowing all of what we need before we even ask And he knows that we need to lay down our lives. So check it out. Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. And Athea, our sister. And Archippus, our fellow soldier. And the church in your house. Now again, might be that they all were of the same family. Now Athea was probably his wife. Philemon's wife and Archippus might have been their son. For sure, though, they had a church in their house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. I love this part that Paul talks about. I didn't talk about this last week, but he gets much joy from how this man Philemon loves other people, not just himself. And how he loves other people, not just loving Paul. And so this is really, really good. You could be excited about the things that excite God. Now, accordingly... Though I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what's required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, 
whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he's indeed useful to you and me. Useful. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. Like, I, I enjoyed having him, but I'm sending him back to you. I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant or slave, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you'll do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. All right, again, here's this personal letter. And it's written very, very personally, like a heartfelt brother to brother, maybe even spiritual father to spiritual son, just crying out to him and asking him to reconcile with Onesimus, who was a bondservant, a slave. And I know that that's just this critical thing, and we look at slavery, and it's so horrendous. This right here doesn't say that it's right or wrong. It's saying what was happening. This man, Philemon, had servants, had bond servants, had slaves. He was rich, big enough house to have a church in it. Not quite like big like this building, but you know what I'm saying. He had stuff. And he had people that were indentured servants or slaves. And one of them was Onesimus. And Onesimus wronged him and then ran away. But Onesimus came to Christ while he was either in prison or visiting this man that was in prison, Paul. And Paul sends him back with this letter to Philemon. I don't know how that went down. But when he saw him coming, was he like the prodigal son, or the prodigal father and the prodigal son? Like, oh, there's my son, I've been looking for him. There's Onesimus, I've been looking for him. You're back, you're safe. Or was he like, ooh, you're in so much trouble. And so let's just get to this question right off the bat. Why reconcile? Why? In that situation, why reconcile? Do you know that Onesimus, by law, could be imprisoned or put to death if he escaped as a slave, as a bond servant, somebody who was given over to service for the rest of his life, whether it was a debt reason or he just wanted a place to live, or he wanted food to eat, or whatever. I mean, Philemon could have saw him coming and said, you're out. What is this guy doing here? Guards, get him. Instead, we know that this letter was delivered by hand, most likely by Onesimus, and Philemon now had to deal with the contents of the letter, and he was supposed to read it to the whole entire church. So, why reconcile? When I have the right not to, when I'd rather be angry, or the people that I'm supposed to reconcile with don't deserve it or haven't earned it, why reconcile? Today's message, for love's sake. It's right in the passage. Right in the passage, it says this in verse 9, yet for love's sake. I prefer to appeal to you. I could command you to reconcile. I could command you to take this guy in as your brother now, because he is in Christ. But instead, I appeal to you for love's sake. And God is love. Look, at this point, I want to say to you yet again that this is a personal message, but not private. 
personal, not private. It hits you personally, but it comes out of you. Does that sound like anything you've heard before? Jesus himself in Matthew 5, right, says that you and I are a city set on a hill. Jesus in Matthew 12, 30, 34 says, out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. You and I cannot be hidden. It may be very personal between us and God, but it becomes very, very public. It's not private. And so why in the world would we reconcile in a world that doesn't want reconciliation, in a, in a body that doesn't want reconciliation? We're just like, nope, I'm just going to fight. Look, it's simultaneously difficult and essential. Since we've been loved, we get to love. Since we've been forgiven, we get to forgive. But it's not just get to. As Christians, we are commanded to love. Yeah, but we have like a limitation. Absolutely, that's why we need Jesus. Remember 2 Corinthians? I mean, we're weak. And in our weakness, his strength is perfected. Look, I'm going to go back to a few things about love's sake, and we're going to go to Philemon 3. We're going to go 4 through 9 as well. I want to read this again. I want to unpack this a little bit with you. Then we'll go 12 through 16, and we're going to move our way through the rest of the message. And we're going to get back to this question, why reconcile? First of all, for love's sake, for the sake of love. God is love. Remember 1 John not too long ago? God is love. Not love is God. God is love. And he has displayed what that looks like. He made us. He redeems us. He wants us. He wants you. He loves you. And he also loves others. And he wants to love others through you. All right. Check this out. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. He's thankful for him, right? Let me go back to verse 3 for a second. Sorry. He says right off the bat, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to need grace. Grace isn't earned. Grace is given. Grace is needed. And then so he says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. I know you love people. I know you love them well and I thank God for that. And I know you have faith in Jesus Christ. He's appealing to Philemon's real identity. Remember that from last week. True identity. Whose you are. But he's appealing to this love. And I pray that the sharing of your faith, not keeping it to yourself, not private, but public, that it will become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. He's like tying them in, right? Like, I want good stuff for you, man. I want the full knowledge of Christ. I want people to see it. I want people to know every good thing. For I've derived much joy and comfort from your love. This is the third time we hear about love already in just a few verses. So I've derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because of the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. You already know how to do this. Accordingly, so he ties that in, right? Because of this love and how you refresh people. Though I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is right or required, by the way, required, that's a big word. Reconciliation is required? It is. And it's a great gift. And it's required of us. Okay. Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. He's appealing for love's sake. Why reconcile? For love's sake. And then here he goes even further into it, verses 12 through 16. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart, my very inside. I love Onesimus like crazy, but I'm sending him to you. He had already appealed to him like, look, I know he's useless to you as a runaway slave, but I'm sending him back to you as a brother and as my son. I would have been glad to keep him here with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, or by being guilted into it, but of your own accord. You get to choose what to do with this. 
And I thought about this this week, you guys. Philemon had to read this first. And maybe everybody gathered around, but maybe he just read it. Or maybe he went to his room and to his study and like, I'm going to look at this. And he had to bring it out. And he did bring it out because we're reading it 2,000 plus years later. And so for this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while. That you might have him back forever. He left and it was bad. What was intended for evil, God flipped the script and made it good. Does that still happen today? Does God still use these trials, these tribulations that we're going through and bring us to an eternal perspective? Not only do I believe so, I testify. He's done so in my life over and over again. So many things happened to me as a kid. So many things happened to me that I did and all the consequences and God flipping the script over and over again. So you'd have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother. There's that word love again. Especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? Have you thought about how rad this story is? Paul is in prison. And he meets a guy that knows a guy that Paul also knows. He didn't just know that guy, though. Onesimus was this guy's servant, was his bondservant, was his slave. And he did something wrong and ran away. (laughs) He got gone. And God found him. God never doesn't know where we're at, by the way. Never doesn't? Sorry, double negative. He always knows where you are. But he brings these people back together. Paul has now led Philemon to the Lord and Onesimus. And what a great mediator. But we get offended. And Philemon was offended. But Paul is appealing on love's sake to not being offended. But to see that God redeems people and brings stories back around. And I'm praying in Jesus' name that you see that. All of you with whatever might be going on. And we may not believe that it can happen, but God knows how to write a great story. So he says, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all, which we know that he has. Oh, sorry, I'm going too much, too much. Let me, let me bring this back around. If we're looking at for love's sake, would you... Take a second with me to look back at something we read just a few weeks ago in 1 John. It's 1 John 4, 10 through 11. And in this 1 John passage, we find out about love. But love isn't just like love between you and God, although that's super important. But it's also love for your neighbors. It's love for yourself. This isn't just private. This is public. 1 John 4, 10 through 11, says it just like this. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the payment, the cooling, the reconciliation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So that got me all kinds of stoked. I started thinking like, okay, wait, God loved us first, and that motivates us to love ourselves and to love others. And this whole idea of reconciliation, there has to be people willing to be a part of this, right? There's a mediator, there's an offender, and an offended person. But there has to be this willingness. When there is a willingness, gosh, anything could happen because of who God is. Let's go to Ephesians 4.32. Maybe you understand this. Maybe you've memorized this. We're going to actually be in the book of Ephesians a bunch starting in September. And so uh, it's a little snapshot, right? A little preview. Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. 
You guys, I don't have a lot of time this morning for it. I want to encourage you maybe in the time that you have after this, uh, maybe not worry about, you know, spending a bunch of time watching something else or maybe even getting a bunch of projects done immediately. Maybe spend some time eating breakfast together and conversing, but in your own personal time, I want to encourage you to go and read Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is wonderful. So much packed in there. But we understand that there's this parable, right, of the unforgiving servant. You remember this story, and, and I'll unpack it for you really quick. This guy owes so much more than he could ever pay. And the king says, you owe me that money. And if not, you're going to be thrown in prison, so are your family. And he's like, no, 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 no. Please, please, I'll pay it back. And the king actually says, you're forgiving your debt. And that guy's like, oh, thank you. And he literally goes out from that interaction See somebody that owes him just a few bucks and says, pay it all back to me. You owe me. And then he says, I, I'll, just, I'll pay you back. Right? Does this sound familiar? He was just going through that. And the guy who was just forgiven goes, nope, go to jail. And the reality is people saw that. People are going to see how you interact. People are going to see how you deal with one another. The king heard about this and threw that first dude in prison and his family too. But before all that, Jesus told this story as a response to something that I think you and I can really relate to. Like, how much do I have to forgive? How much do I have to love? How much do I have to be like Jesus? Here's what it is. Matthew 18, 21 through 22. Peter came up to Jesus and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? You probably already know this, but allow me to tell you. Three times forgiving somebody was the, the gold standard. The Pharisees said that. Look, forgive three times. After that, it's over. Peter doubles that and then adds one has the biblical hebrew number of perfection number seven how many times should i do seven lord like i'm way up there and jesus said to him i don't say to you seven times but 77 times and this is profound he's saying from your heart forgive your brother wants to be forgiven you forgive him so i ask you again this question why reconcile? We said for love's sake, but even deeper than that, for Christ's sake. My grandfather used to say for Christ's sake, and I don't think he was being honoring to God about that. But it's so crazy, right? We know that for Christ's sake is a much, much greater purpose. Why would we reconcile? Why would we forgive from our hearts 77 times or 70 times 7 or millions of times every time that we would be asked to be forgiven? I'm not, you know what? At this moment, there's so many people, and, and I hear their voices saying, well, it's just not always that easy. I never once said it was easy. It's actually contradictory to all that seems right inside of us. I'm not asking you to go back into an abusive physical, emotional, sexual experience. I'm not saying go back and just be a piñata. I'm saying when people want to be forgiven, when people seek forgiveness, you, as a forgiven one, get to forgive. It doesn't mean you put your head on the chopping block. But friend, there is discernment here to be had. You and I, because we've been forgiven, get to forgive. You and I, for Christ's sake, get to be his people. Get to live out what this looks like. I'm going to finish with a couple things. I'm going back to Ephesians again. And this is like a, a passage in Ephesians 5. Again, we're going to unpack this a bunch in a few weeks. But this is one that I have to keep coming to. Ephesians 4 and 5 has been powerful for me in reconciliation. And I always get to it. Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Why reconcile? Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but wise. 
making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And don't get drunk with wine. Don't get filled up with wine. Don't try to numb yourself with drugs and alcohol. For that's debauchery. That's wild living. Instead, be filled. Be drunk, if you will, with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. I mean, gosh, you're just like walking down the street whistling tunes about Jesus and how awesome he is. Interacting with people, singing hymns and spiritual songs to one another. That sounds really weird and goofy and kind of wonderful. Are you willing to have a heart that knows how much you've been loved? So that just flows out of you? Keep Focusing there, Jesus, is your Savior, your personal Lord and Savior, and it comes out publicly. So giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Only you can make all things work, Jesus. And then finally here, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That you would do what you do for Christ's sake, not just people. So we'll finish with the, the jump that I had before to Philemon's, Philemon 17 through 21. Philemon's, I'm giving him a, it's like Walmart's. All right, Philemon 17 through 21. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you'd receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. This is a shout out to the gospel of Jesus Christ. What he did for us, not because of his own sin, because he didn't have any. It was for us. He paid on his account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Like You need a motivation. Go to the fact that you have been paid for. And so when you're paying, you're paying with what God has given you to pay with. <sighs> yes, brother, I want some benefit from you and the Lord. He's not asking for money. He's not asking for him to give him anything exceptional personally. He's saying, give this love. Pay this to another person. Forgive Onesimus. Refresh my heart in Christ. I'm confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will, be, you will do even more than I say. <laughs> he just knows. He knows this guy. Remember your love. You love to refresh. Well, here's the biggest test ever, Philemon. Instead of throwing this dude in prison, instead of getting this guy killed, which he deserved, welcome him back. As a brother. I was reading through the Gospel Transformation Bible. There's a lot of really cool notes in there. And this one stood out. And we're going to finish with this today. This is what the Gospel does. The love of Christ flows through us onto others. You don't just hang on to it. Philemon had this wonderful opportunity, right? to use his good deeds to bring praise to the Father. Again, this is the kingdom message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that it's his love, his agenda, his reconciliation, his ministry of reconciliation flowing through us to others. Jesus, I pray right now in your precious, powerful, almighty name that you would give us Eyes to see where we can reconcile with others, where we can help others to reconcile, where we can forgive, where we can seek forgiveness, where we can help others to settle those accounts, to outdo one another in kindness, in goodness, in compassion. God, to be like your son, Jesus. And Lord, give us the strength to want to. As it says right here at the end, 
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with our spirits. I pray in his perfect name. Amen. And don't forget the discussion questions, please. I, I hope those are effective. Maybe go through them throughout the week or just do it right now with the Lord and you and your friends and family. Please continue to gather with people. And we got one more church in the parking lot. So please come and join us. Jesus loves you. I love you. God bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you rest. Peace. Thank you.